So congratulations, you did it. You made it all the way to the end. That's a huge accomplishment. Don't sell yourself short. When I look at the given views for a, uh, for a course, I'll typically see the first two or three videos in the course have an astronomical number of views, and then it begins to tail off over time until you get to the very end, and, well, you see a rather small percentage of those who started actually finishing the course. And that used to concern me, thinking, well, maybe I could be a little bit more engaging and keep people's interest longer. But the good folks at Microsoft Virtual Academy assured me that that happens across the board with every course. So I think what's really going on is that everybody has the best of intention to follow through, to watch an entire course. But then life happens, distractions pop up, maybe changes in priority, you know, present themselves, they interrupt or completely halt progress. But the good news is that is not you. You were able to make it all the way through to the end, and now you're well on your way to mastering C Sharp, or at least learning more about C Sharp, and then from here learning more about .NET, picking a user interface technology, whether for web, Windows, or mobile, maybe learning more about databases, uh, to maybe using C Sharp to access APIs around the internet. And we'll talk about some of those things that you could learn as you move on from here a little bit later in this video. But soon you're going to be building your own applications, whether for yourself, uh, for your employer, maybe, uh, maybe your future employer. But whatever the case might be, congratulations. I really encourage you to continue your momentum. Don't stop here. Keep pushing forward. Keep taking baby, baby steps on a daily basis. As you know, daily progress, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is how you make real improvements in your life. It's how you add skills to your skill set. Uh, and you've taken this great first step in the right direction, and I'm proud of you. Can't say that enough. Great job. And uh, I'll continue to encourage you throughout this lesson. But I want to wrap up the series in this lesson and provide a few suggestions about where to look for answers whenever they pop up uh, from here on out, uh, as inevitably you can continue by building applications and learning more about the various APIs that are available to C-sharp developers. We're also going to talk about the right way and the wrong way to ask for help out on the internet. And then I'll make a few suggestions on topics that you sh might want to investigate from here on out uh, as you continue your self-directed training. But before I get started in earnest, let me say that some of the ideas that we talked about here, especially some of the more advanced concepts that I hinted at or that I said, okay, you can let this go in one ear and out the other, just wanted to show it to you real briefly. Uh, some of these things could require weeks or months or even years of thought work before your mind is really able to accept them and digest them. I mean, I've, I know I've personally spent hours just staring at a wall thinking about some programming concept, trying to wrap my head around it. The mind needs quiet time to reflect. You need to put yourself into a position to, to succeed by giving your mind the time to discover, the time to ask the crucial questions, the time to allow those neurons to make those vital connections. Honestly, there are things that I learned about 10 years ago that I'm still trying to really wrap my head around, figure out what this means overall, uh, in what contexts it applies, uh, things like that. And many times I might need to read uh, different books and articles, watch videos, and to hear what different authors have to say about a given topic before it finally resonates with me and I, I really understand what the topic is, how it pertains to me, what do I need to do with it, things like that. Each author who talks or writes about a given topic can say things in just a little bit a little bit differently, and sometimes that can finally unlock something for me. So uh, don't forget to keep, keep pushing forward and keep learning because there's always answers out there. But ultimately, I hope you realize that you really don't need to know everything right away to get started and to be productive right now. You don't have to be an expert first before you can begin to write software. In fact, some concepts really only make sense after you have more experience. Once you've made some mistakes or you can see where a given idea, and, oh, I see where that applies, I could use that here in this scenario. That finally makes sense to me why I would want to do that. 
So object-oriented programming is a good example, and there are some others too. So I titled this lesson, Where Do You Go From Here? And my intent was to answer that in two different ways. So first of all, where do you go from here whenever you have a problem and you're having a, a hard time resolving the problem and getting back on your feet again? Well, there's a good chance at some point, uh, you're as you're learning, as you're building applications, you're going to run into error messages or uh, something that just doesn't make any sense. It happens to everybody. But I would encourage you to not fret. Uh, I think, in fact, what makes programming such a vital skill is learning how to solve problems that combine your existing knowledge uh, with your ability to reason through what could be uh, the problem and then your ability to research and perform research on a given problem until you, you come up with a solution to it. And the good news is that there's this large community of other developers inside and outside of Microsoft that can help nudge you and get you past these sorts of problems. These people write blog posts. They answer questions in the various forums. They write books. They record screencast video tutorials like this one. And you can tap into that community of knowledge at, at any time. But let me give you a few tips on how to utilize that community in the most effective way. So let's suppose that you do hit a wall. Uh, you're experiencing some issue with your application. It's not behaving the way that you expected. Maybe you're getting some strange error message popping up every time you try to debug your application. So where do you start uh, to debug this, to, to pick apart the problem and, and get to the root issue? Well, first of all, I research using key phrases directly from the error message itself, and I can't emphasize how vitally important that is. So if, if there's an error number or a specific phrase that I can latch onto, and I can surround those in double quotes as I type in my query to bing.com, that always helps me get closer to a resolution. I might spend 10 to 15 minutes scanning through various blogs and forum posts or on MSDN uh, as search results pop up for these sources in order to find a potential solution. And if I'm mindful about my search terms, I almost always find a solution. I think there's a, the reason why a lot of beginners fail with finding solution to their problems is because they become impatient or they don't use, uh, they don't, they don't use the exact error messages in their searches and they don't know how to search correctly and they're not willing to put in the time to actually read through uh, pages and pages of content to find a solution to the problem. So I can't emphasize enough using the exact phrase inside the error message that you see on screen surrounded with double quotes will get you closer to finding a resolution to the issue that you're having. Um, there are always usually people with other similar issues that have posted and then uh, and then and then explain what they did to actually solve that particular issue. So research is vital. And I think actually one vital skill as a modern software developer is to become great at search. <laughs> uh, searching on the internet to help solve issues that you run into is such a vital skill. Now it might seem easier to go directly to the forums immediately and to post a question to the forums in hopes that somebody else can help solve your problem for you. But I assure you that it will actually take longer to ask the question and get an answer than it would if you were just, if you spent the time searching, refining your searches and so on until you find a solution to your problem. Uh, frankly, I almost never have to ask a question in the forums because a simple search will almost always yield a clue to what I did wrong or what the core issue is. In fact, I, I've kind of gotten embarrassed when I have to ask questions. Maybe that's a bad attitude to have. But I don't want to burden other people with um, when they could be answering other legitimate questions. So I go overboard and try to figure out the issue on my own. Now, virtually any issue that you run into, I'm almost positive that somebody else has at some point run into that issue before you have. And they've already posted the solution to that problem online. You just need to get out there and find it. And if you get good at doing research, doing searches on the internet uh, to help find solution to your problems, then it'll get you back on your feet faster than, again, posting 
into a forum and asking other people for help. Now, let's suppose that you're at your wit's end and you've done searches and there's nothing out there that really seems to apply to your situation. Okay, nothing you've tried actually works to resolve your problem. Maybe at that point you need to ask for help. That's fine. So here's what you really need to do to get uh, whenever you ask for help. You need uh, to ask your question in such a way that you're going to get a resolution. And how you ask your question is important. So first of all, you need to be an empathetic requester. In other words, you need to give people who are willing to help all the information they need to actually get you back on your feet again, to pinpoint the issue and then uh, isolate the issue and uh, prescribe a solution. This means that you need to, first of all, clearly state your request. And so there's kind of a checklist that I have in my mind of the things that you need to do. And some of these will, will be obvious and some of them you may have not considered before, so let me just go through them real quick here. First of all, you should start by posting your question in the, the right place. Find the right category in the given forum or use the correct tags for your, for your post and so that the right people are looking at your questions. Posting a C-sharp question in a visual basic form is not going to be all that productive. In fact, you'll probably get chided for it. Uh, secondly, you, you also need to choose a simple, clear title for your post so that it attracts attention of the people who can help so that it saves everybody a lot of time. If I see a forum post that just says, please help, um, I usually just skip it. If it says, link to objects queries yielding unexpected results, well, hmm, okay, that's oddly specific. That might be something I can help with. I look like the person put some effort into concisely stating what the issue is. So I'll read the question and I'll see if I can help. Uh, third, a short synopsis of the issues that you're having, including the exact error message including the exact behavior you are expecting and what you're actually experiencing. Describe what you expected to happen, but what in it happened instead, and keep it concise. Fourth, if you can, at all possible, include screenshots. And ideally, you would go one step further and actually use some screen editing or image editing software and draw circles to draw the eye's attention to those parts of the screenshot that, that are pertinent to your question. Uh, fifth, if possible, include a code example. Uh, make sure to change any super secret information, passwords, things of that nature before you post it. But uh, without a code snippet, many problems are are insolvable. Okay, uh, I can't tell you how many times I get people writing me emails and they say, "I'm having a problem with this. What do you think the solution is?" I'm like, "Well, show me some code, okay? I need to see what you did to get to that point, and then maybe I can help you figure out what your issue is." So always include, if you can, a code snippet of the code that you think is causing the problem. Then be choosy about which code that you actually choose to post. There's nothing more frustrating than looking at somebody who posts like 200 lines of code and expecting me to go through it all when a lot of it doesn't even pertain to the question at hand. I mean, you had to spend a little bit of time narrowing it down to a few things, right? So you really need to help me be empathetic to me, the person who's willing to help you, to identify those lines of code that might be involved in the issue. Number six, if a given forum has special HTML tags or short codes that you can use to format the code or some other aspect of your, of your question to help it stand out in the post, then you definitely should use it. All right. Number seven, tell me, what have you done so far to try to resolve the issue? Um, did it change anything at all? Did it change anything? Did it help? <laughs> uh, did this lead you to rule out certain possibilities? Again, empathize with me, the person who's reading your, your question, trying to help you. This will result in a faster resolution. Otherwise, people will start with the obvious issues and then move forward. So there's just that old joke, you know, hey, I'm having a problem with my computer. And the technician asks, well, do you have it plugged in? Everybody says, oh, the technician was. <laughs> ah. But... There's a reason why they do that, and it's because most the most obvious answer uh, is the one that most of the time works for people. All right, so don't be that guy. Make sure you already list out what it is that you try to do, and you've eliminated it as a possibility. Uh, 
And so number eight, tell me which operating system you're using, which version of Visual Studio and the .NET framework, which programming language you're using, which updates or service packs have been applied, anything that you feel is pertinent to help me help you diagnose the issue. That matters more than you might realize. Number nine, suppose that there's a resolution to the issue. You actually figured it out. Awesome. Very cool. Maybe somebody made some suggestions that led you down to investigate some things and you finally figured it out. That's great. So take a moment, go back wherever you asked the question and describe exactly what you did to resolve the issue step by step. Use that as a means of better understanding it yourself and articulating that will help you better understand the issue and what the solutions are. And then it's also, it makes you part of the community of the wealth of information that's out there uh, so that others in the future who have the same issue can look at your post and that you are feeding it back into the community just like you're taking out of the community. Um, so chances are that Honestly, that person that you help in the future is actually you. I can't tell you how many times that I've found a resolution to something, and then months later, I, I hit up against the same thing, thinking to myself, I know I've solved this once, and I'll go searching for a solution, and I'll find the exact solution, and I'll rate it. Oh, that was me. That was me who answered the question. So um, it would be nice just to search for your own solution online if you knew where it was, or at least find your, you know, be courtesy to your to everyone else and your future self to actually uh, post answers to the questions that you have. All right, and then finally, absolutely, 100%, be polite. People don't owe you an answer. They don't owe you anything. They're, if they're going to help you, they're gonna do it out of the kindness of their hearts. They're gonna be doing it in their spare time as a means of maybe you know, furthering their own understanding, uh, helping themselves grow, but then also uh, to help you grow as a software developer. So say please and thank you and be nice and then help other developers uh, as, as you have the opportunity. Uh, I do sell training content but I give a lot of it away for free. I do ask questions in the forums but I answer a bunch too. So make sure that you become part of that community and that you are feeding back into the community your own help and your support uh, just like you've been supported by others. All right. So you might be wondering where do you go to find this level of support where you can ask questions. And that really depends. Uh, typically, I'd recommend that you go to uh, msdn.microsoft.com. Here, let's go out there real quick. So uh, msdn.microsoft.com slash forums. And it might redirect you based on... Um, where you are in the world, but typically uh, you can choose uh, from a number of different forums, so you definitely want to find the specific technology or language or whatever the case might be, uh, or do a quick search for those keywords, again, right here inside of the MSDN forums. Uh, it is monitored by Microsoft employees, as well as people called Microsoft Most Valuable Professionals, or MVPs. So MVPs are usually knowledgeable people who've demonstrated their willingness to help, and they've been identified by Microsoft as people who are willing to help, and uh, so they qualify for that based on some criteria, not the least of which is participation in these forums. Then there's also another more comprehensive place you can, you can take a look. Um, Uh, Stack Exchange, so programmers.stackexchange.com, and there might be one other um, place where you could go that has uh, also by the same company that has similar forms, depending on the type of information you're looking for. Now, in my experience, Stack Exchange is a little bit more um, iffy. Uh, it's a little less beginner friendly. Maybe that's changed by the time that you visit, and I only say that it's a little less friendly because not only will you be critiqued for how you ask your question, but very often if people do a search to help you and then they find that there's already an existing question that's similar enough to you, they'll shut your question down. So, you know, just follow their rules. Do an extensive search before you, you ask a duplicate question. 
don't take offense to criticism about your question. Uh, and again, I'd recommend that you search long and hard before actually posting the question because, again, I'm convinced that virtually everything that you could run into has been asked by somebody already. Uh, you just need to spend the time to find that answer that you're looking for. All right, so I said that I would answer the question of where to go from here in two different ways. And uh, I've answered the, uh, the question where to go whenever you have problems. But now I want to answer the question, where do I go to learn more about application development? Where do I go to learn more about software development? Um, and so at this point, you know, you've got a pretty good foundation of C Sharp. Uh, basic knowledge of the C-sharp programming language and of .NET and a little bit about Visual Studio, but there's still a lot of opportunity to practice what you know and to grow beyond that. So no matter what type of application that you want to build, there are a few fundamental ideas that are really going to be, uh, that you need to be fundamentally acquainted with before you move on. So first of all, I would recommend that uh, you learn about relational databases like SQL Server. You learn how to access data that's stored in a database using the Entity Framework part of the .NET API for accessing data in your applications. Uh, both Visual, uh, SQL Server and the Entity Framework have visual tools that you can use inside of Visual Studio to drag and drop and configure your settings and selections. And so spending some time not only learning about uh, the tools and the APIs themselves, but then also these visual tools inside of Visual Studio can pay big dividends. You'll want to quickly grow past that and learn how to write code and rely less on the visual designers and Visual Studio, but still, it's a great tool to help you get to that point where you can be productive quickly. Next, you're going to need to choose a presentation technology that you want to master, and this is really more about platform, honestly, than just simple UI. Um, so you have no lack of options, whether you want to be build web or Windows applications or mobile applications or games or back-end processes, um, whatever the case might be. So say, for example, you want to build web applications. There's a couple of different platforms. The older API is called ASP.NET Web Forms, and there's a lot of code that was written on the Web Forms platform uh, API. But then there's also a newer API that's called ASP.NET Core MVC. Uh, and there are some huge differences between the two, but we don't have enough time to talk about those. I have content on both of those topics on my own website, Debut. There's Windows Forms, which is the older desktop API. Then there's Windows Presentation Foundation, which is a newer API that companies use for building applications internally. And then there's the Universal Windows Platform, which you build, use to build more consumer-oriented applications, typically, for sale on the, uh, the Windows Store. There's also the Xamarin Platform, which Microsoft recently purchased at the time I'm recording this, for building true cross-platform apps for iOS and Android and even Windows Phone. And then there's uh, a third party called Unity, uh, Unity 3D or 2D, depending on the type of game that you want to build. And so you might want to check out Unity for building games. Now, if you're not really sure about where you should go next and what you should learn next, I really would recommend that if you don't already know HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, that's a great place to start. And I've created several fundamental series on Channel 9 that, that are aimed at each of these topics. Uh, they're also available here on Microsoft Virtual Academy, again, at the time when I recorded this. Uh, and then beyond that, I recommend learning about the basic tenets of application architecture, particularly how to structure your code into layers of responsibility and what that even means. So splitting your code into layers of responsibility will help you build applications that can withstand the impact of change. And like I said earlier in this series, change comes from a number of different places. It could be changing business rules. It could be changing requirements, uh, changes in the technology that's available. It also comes from defects in your software, re bug reports that come in, and you need to make changes to fix those. But in each case, you can mitigate the impact, the negative impact of making changes in your code by encapsulating the responsibilities behind well-established APIs between each of the layers of responsibility. And I spend a lot of time talking about this, about application architecture on DevU. So if that's something that interests you, you definitely want to check that out. 
But from there, you want to learn more about the basic software design patterns and tactics and techniques. And there are a few keywords that you're going to want to learn about. And each of these can spawn an entire book, an entire video series. And I've already alluded to the topic of object-oriented programming. That's a huge topic uh, that you definitely want to learn about first. Uh, and if you can just get your mind wrapped around object-oriented programming and how that changes the way that you uh, create solutions to programming problems, then that's a huge step in the right direction. But beyond that, you're going to want to learn about the principles of software development, principles that guide you uh, to write your code in a very object-oriented sort of way. Uh, there are some more generalized principles, like the dry principle. I don't know if that I've ever given it a name, but it's essentially don't repeat yourself. So, you know, I said be, be leery of copying and pasting. And when you do find yourself, uh, you know, wanting to copy and paste code into multiple places in your application, you should be stopping yourself and thinking, how can I create this in such a way that I can reuse it? So don't repeat yourself put code extracted out that's re that will be reused into its own uh, method or class and then reuse it from there. There's also another principle called YAGNI or Y-A-G-N-I which is you ain't gonna need it <laughs> uh, which means yeah you could probably uh, set yourself up and architect your application in such a way that uh, in the future, you could expand, but you're probably not going to need to do that. You ain't going to need it. All right. Then there's another uh, principle or idea called dependency injection, which is super important. It's a design pattern that guides you toward towards building loosely coupled objects that then can be swapped in and out of the solution. And you'll want to learn about dependency injection. It's really crucial to building some of the new style applications using like the ASP.NET Core MVC, which relies heavily on dependency injection. There's also a set of principles called SOLID, S-O-L-I-D. Each of those stand for a different sub-principle. Uh, they help you realize the promise of object-oriented programming inside of your applications. So again, a lot of, a lot of uh, ideas that are more conceptual in nature and less code uh, code syntax or tool oriented. All right. Uh, you're also going to want to learn about the process of software development, so the workflow surrounding software development and managing software projects. So specifically, you're going to want to learn about the tools and the techniques that you use whenever you work inside of a team. Sharing source code between team members using a source code repository like Git uh, or like Visual Studio Online's implementation of Git and um, their own internal uh, source code repository tool. You're definitely going to want to learn about building unit tests uh, which are tiny little code-based tests that continually are testing your code every time you run it. Some people have even gone as far to say that you should be writing those little unit tests first and then you write the actual production code that satisfies those unit tests. Now whenever there's a change made in the system, you can see what the impact of that change is because you'll begin to see these little, tool, these little tests start failing. That is a process called test-driven development and some people swear by it, other people swear at it. <laughs> so you're also going to want to learn about agile project management, um, agile software development techniques, defining requirements in, uh, in user stories, playing a game called planning poker to determine what features can we include in a given iteration of our software building process, uh, using agile boards to manage assigned tasks between the various software developers on the team. You're going to want to learn about the nature of iterative development. I already used that term, iteration. So you want to learn about what are iterations and what are the goals of iterations and why they're useful. You'll want to learn about developing a spike of functionality all the way through all the layers of responsibility in your system. So I've given you probably, what, several dozen different key terms that you could use as a launching point to search, search on. Uh, and honestly, if you just were to 
if you were to look at all those terms that I just used, it'll take you several years to learn about all those things, even at a very general, uh, in a general way. But fortunately, again, you don't have to know it all to get started and be productive today. So yeah, there's so much to learn and so little time, uh, but it's what makes software development um, fun and makes it exciting because there's always something new to learn and some new technique to try. I've had friends at Microsoft actually confide in me that it's a challenge for them to keep up with it all. Nobody just knows all this stuff automatically. You know, it's, it's a challenge for everyone, everybody to keep up with. Uh, nobody just knows it all. It just keeps evolving. And so you just have to really commit yourself to learning. I realized some time ago that my full-time job is not creating video content or training content for, for developers. My full-time job is really learning. And then if I create training content, that's really a byproduct of all the learning that I'm doing. The value that I have to somebody else is my knowledge. And so without that as kind of the core piece of, of what I do, whether it's building applications for somebody or creating training content, they're, uh, they're only interested in, in me because of my knowledge. And then how I apply that knowledge is a byproduct of actually gaining the knowledge. So you have to really commit to learning. And I know since you're here on Microsoft Virtual Academy that you're, you've already done that to some degree. There's a, a bunch of great resources out that are available on the internet, not the least of which are Channel 9 and Microsoft Virtual Academy, obviously. There's MSDN, uh, as we looked at earlier in this series. Uh, however, before I close this out, let me make one final plug for you to visit my website. If you haven't already, Developer University at devu.com. It's there on screen. Uh, it's, I've designed the courses there specifically for someone who's a beginner to help them get up and running as quickly as possible, pointing out what I feel like they really need to know in order to master key ideas that will lead them to, uh, to get jobs in the software development industry, uh, providing homework exercises and quizzes, but more importantly, uh, coding challenges that force people to write and to, to develop the muscles of your mind that allow you to pick apart a problem and create a solution for it, all right? So please check check out uh, devu.com whenever you get a chance. All right, so as I close here, I hope you found this course to be valuable and this lesson to be valuable. Uh, if there's anything that I can ever do to help you, please let me know. You can find me out on Twitter. I sometimes go out there. Hit me up on Facebook or you know you can write me an email. Uh, but finally, as we close out, I sincerely wish you uh, the best of luck in your career. C Sharp and software development is such an exciting field to be a part of. And I'm really excited for you. So good luck. Uh, thank you for watching this series.